a month. Okay. We are live. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us for another edition of Wine Down Wednesday. We are joined by the incomparable Will Jones and Monique Wingard. Wingard. Thank you. Thank you for pronouncing it correctly, Lee. I appreciate that. Always, <laughs> always. How are you all doing? And, and, and tell us a little bit about your holidays. Any Kwanzaa celebrations planning? Any New Year's Eve? Well, I didn't celebrate anything uh, Kwanzaa related just yet. Uh, I don't think anything is really going on um, with uh, the variant, but happy Kwanzaa to everyone. I went home to Cincinnati for Christmas to spend with my family. Uh, so that was exciting. Being in journalism, you don't get to go home often. And we got a dog. Let me let me get the dad the dog. Oh. Congrats are in order for a new new family member. <laughs> oh, you knew what you were doing when you got okay. What's it's a golden it? doodle. It's uh her her name. His name right. is uh Porto. Everyone keeps saying her, so now I think I'm getting on that bandwagon. But yeah, we 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 brought him home. And I have not really slept that well, so I'm really, really tired. Uh, we're in the process of uh, house training him. Uh, it's going so-so. Um, he's trying, but it's, it's a little bit of a struggle. I think all of your woes about engagement on Instagram are now solved thanks to Porto. Exactly, exactly. It's People love post, post pictures of the puppy, and you're in there. Yeah, exactly. Name <laughs> inspiration. Where did I come from? So we honeymooned in Portugal, and we really loved our time this past September. And there's this wine called Port Wine, but it's Porto in uh, Portuguese. I think it's named after a region where the wine is produced. So we were just trying to think of names related to our honeymoon, and I, I said Porto, and we, we like that. But I think he looks like a Gus. I don't know, for some reason. <laughs> I like I like Gus also, but I, I think the name will not matter because um, Porto, his current name, is so cute that I think you could go with just about anything. It it, it won't matter. Yeah. The the, the cuteness factor just uh, you know trumps everything. <laughs> so Portillos had nothing to do with it. No, no, not not Portillos. I really don't eat at Portillos. I'm not a fast a food type of person. Um, so uh, no disrespect to Port Portillos. Um, it's, it's a good place to just, you know, is it? they have I, good cake. I, yeah. I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> We're not from Chicago. We, we, we can, we can be honest about where we eat. Exactly. Like, cheese steak, <laughs> though, is fantastic. Like Italian beef is kind of gross, but a Philly cheese steak is. Mm. So again, these are, uh, just a disclaimer to all, uh, viewers <laughs> tonight. You have all three native Ohioans hosting oh, I didn't tonight. Know that. Yes, uh, three native Ohioans tonight hosting who do, in fact, love Chicago mm -hmm. and love NABJ Chicago as well. However, it has now been established that we're not fans of the, um, the beef. No. Okay. okay. So how was, how, how was your, uh, your Christmas? You were telling me before we uh, came on that. Yes. So I... Um, was in charge as always um, of hosting the family, which is immediate and extended family on Zoom. So I just made sure I got on Canva, uh, canva.com, I'll go ahead and, and promote. What's that? Um, it is a platform that I use to create graphics. So okay. there's, there's a freebie for anybody watching tonight, but I always hop on there, create a nice uh, image, send it out to the family so they know what time to arrive on Zoom and how, and how to get there, more importantly. That's important, so to know how to log in and have a good time. So I, I stayed home this year. And home, the new variant. And home is in uh, DC right now. It is Northern, home is technically Northern Virginia. Okay. Uh, so that I can attend Howard University. So I am no longer in, in Chicago, we'll always have love for Chicago, but I have relocated to the DMV area. And you've been producing our show, and this is the first show I think you've joined and you helped moderate, and 
We're sad to see you go. You you brought a, a great energy to NABJ Chicago. It helped us out uh, digitally, showed us new things, uh, got rid of some of the old ways that <laughs> some of the folks wanted to keep. And it was time for us to, you know, upgrade. So you really upgraded NABJ uh, Chicago. And for that, we we appreciate it. It was my my pleasure. I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, I did not so much enjoy that first meeting I attended where I um, was so nervous and also very underemployed. And that's the day I met Lee, as a matter of fact, because mm -hmm. I think we were both there on the same mission uh, after uh, leaving Ohio in uh, pursuit of new opportunity. And I had uh, the courage to stand before all of the members and let them know if in fact someone wanted to hire an aspiring uh, journalist or a di digital nista <laughs> that I was I was for hire and ready to work but um, I was lucky to work for a lot of great brands um, in Chicago I learned a lot I even started a business and now all of that is on halts for me to be a full-time student and uh, and also teacher or a professor rather so you're getting um, your PhD School of Communications. Yes, I'm getting my PhD at the Kathy Hughes School of Communications at Howard University. And I also teach two sections of an undergraduate co undergraduate course in the School of Communication um, three days a week. So I have had to unload quite a few things, not just my duties here as a member of Chicago chapter, but it has been my pleasure. And will you want us to call you doctor? Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely, because this this is no easy feat. So I will be one of those people. Maybe uh, I won't be rude about it, but there will be an expectation. Oh, so in like social settings where we're just, you know, when I, my wife and I come to D.C. and we reach out, I'm going to have to refer to you as doctor? No. Okay. All right. No, I'm not going to take it that far. Okay. <laughs> well, we're just so, so proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Sure. Did you well, all before we switch gears? Tell me about one of the things you really enjoyed about not in the of Chicago, because of course you loved all that. What do you love most about DC now outside of school? And Lee, can we get some volume? We barely can hear you. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, it's kind of low. Oh man, okay. I'll, yeah, I'll I thought you were, you were doing like the Jackson, you know, the voice, you know, the whisper. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what I enjoy um, before we do switch gears, I can go right to the weather. I have enjoyed going out just like this without um, the puff coat, the furry hoods, the boots coming up to the knee, um, you name it. I can't believe right now all of the clothing items that I acquired while living in Chicago are still in storage. Wow. I haven't I haven't needed them once, so um, I'll probably just survive with my pea coat and be fine just um, with that. But uh, other than the weather, so that's the first thing that came to mind is because I can get by with just layering. Um, would be just the this, uh, rediscovery of the city. Um, when I lived in Cleveland, I always looked for an excuse to um, to visit the DMV area. But you know, being a visitor versus actually being a, a resident is obviously different. So um, I have just enjoyed getting to know my neighborhood. Uh, maybe not so much my neighbors because we are in a global pandemic, but <laughs> uh, just getting to to um, to find my place in my new home has just been been a pleasure. And, and also, um, again, I mentioned the challenge of being a student, but uh, successfully completing that first semester, so. Um, feeling that sense of accomplishment are three things that come to mind that I have enjoyed. How many more semesters do you have to go? Uh, if I think about it in terms of semesters, that makes it seem overwhelming. So we're going to go with years. So three three more years, technically. Okay. Wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. But I'm ready. Yeah, but you're talking about the weather in D.C. Wait until the summer. is It's going to be, you're going to, Need some deodorant, you know, some multiple layers of deodorant. Uh, I I own sundresses. I'll be fine. Okay. I have a sundress collection. <laughs> and surprisingly, this fall in uh, Chicago hasn't hasn't been that bad. I was just we just finally got snow, and it's winter now, so we didn't have any snow throughout the 
the ball. So we were we were lucky this year. And that could all be a sign of something that's not great for us. Um, and speaking of, <laughs> even though the weather, um, the signs of things like global, global warming are not good, uh, we do have a guest tonight who is going to speak to us about something that I'm sure we all love, um, but we are going to tap into a few details that raise awareness about the the other side of, of technology, something again that we all need and to a degree do love it, but there are some red flags. There are things that we need to be aware of, um, specifically the, um, the black community, specifically, um, because we have been a target of many, many, and I'll say unfortunate um, campaigns to cause division and to also cause uh, confusion, and uh, I'll put a name to that, which is misinformation and also disinformation. And I'm going to let our guest, um, Mutali and Kande, actually, I guess we will, after I introduce her, I'm going to ask her to kick it off by telling us the difference between misinformation and disinformation, because that was a huge light bulb uh, for me as a communication scholar at Howard was the uh, how people use misinformation and disinformation interchangeably, but they do mean very different things. So our guest tonight is, um, like, like, as I said, is Mutali and Kande. She is the leader and founder of AI for the People. And um, AI for the People is a nonprofit communications firm that uses journalism, arts, and culture to advance racial justice and tech. And AFP's mission is to eliminate the underrepresentation of Black professionals in the American technology sector by 2030. Prior to this, um, Mutali worked in AI governance. And during that time, she was part of the team that introduced the algorithmic and deep fakes, algorithmic acts, as well as the, not, the no biometric barriers to housing act um, with the US House of Representatives. And so uh, without further ado, we welcome Mutali to the Wind Down Wednesday stage. And um, again, Mutali, if you could uh, let us know uh, before we kick things off, the difference between misinformation and, and disinformation, because we're going to be people, you, um, our audience is going to hear that word often tonight. Okay. Um, thank you for having me, everybody. Uh, Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Thank you. Um, I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, so the difference between the two, misinformation is basically wrong advice with no malicious intent. So for example, in your intro, one of your guests said that they got a new dog and it was named um, for the honeymoon in Portugal. In me repeating that story, I might say, I was on a podcast, it was with NABJ Portland, and one of, the, one of the presenters got a cat, right? All of that information is wrong, but I am not being malicious. I am just being inaccurate in my recalling. And usually with misinformation, people will go back and correct, but there is no mis malicious intent. What I'm really interested in um, as a former journalist and as a fellow communication scholar is this idea of disinformation. And what disinformation is, is um, misleading information that has a kernel of truth. So in the example I just gave, it was true I was on a podcast. It was true that it was with NABJ, but the details were off. Whereas with disinformation, they'll take something that's very, very true for example, black people face racism in the US. And then they will add something that is untrue that's meant to misguide us. So the story might be black people face racism in the US, therefore they should not vote. That um, direction not to vote has uh, political implications that has implications for power and it also empowers interests who may be anti-Black and then hurt that community. So disinformation is something that we've heard about a lot 
because it was um, really credited in 2016 for being one of the drivers of um, communication around the the uh, Trump-Clinton presidency. That's the difference between the two. Thank you. So, um, as mentioned, because we we are absolutely going to be discussing um, technology and its impact um, specifically on the Black community, I uh, quickly, for all who are watching, I would like to be clear that uh, Mutali is also um, a journalist. Um, and so yeah. my, my question for you and the question that some people may have is, how did your experience um, as a broadcast uh, journalist lead to your current role as, you know, leading um, AI for the people? Oh, my goodness. Um, very simple. I was not making money <laughs> is the short answer. Um, I started at the BBC. Um, you can tell I have a slight British accent. That's where I grew up and I was um, doing TV journalism. And when I came to the United States, I worked at CNN and ABC here in New York City, where I'm based, and basically could not get a promotion above AP, associate producer, and could not also afford my lifestyle. So like many journalists, was looking at PR and communications as a way to make that career jump, but stay within communication. And for me at the time, I um, initially volunteered to the Obama campaign in 2008, and very quickly they discovered that I had this uh, communications background and ended up on the Twitter team as that platform was in beta. beta. And that kind of jump started a career in technology just because I was one of the very few people that were playing with that platform at the time. Um, that, after that election was over, um, ended up doing some freelance, like political communications work because I had that background. And eventually somebody that I had worked on the campaign with, um, was introducing me to coding organizations. And at the time, we're talking 2010, 2011, there was a bunch of different coding organizations that were, um, focused on children and it was through that connection that I ended up working opposite Google. Google, like any company, has communications function. And before I knew it, I was working in tech. Okay. So that, that explains the, the transition um, for anyone who was wondering. And it's, it is a relatable story. So your, your transition is, a, is one that many people can probably relate to whether they transition into technology or I heard you mention PR. So it is something yeah. that, um, that does in fact happen. Um, with that, you also have experience in policy and government. So I'm going to repeat a few of the, uh, the t- not titles, but positions that I mentioned um, in your bio. So um, with um, AI governance, and then uh, algorithmic and deep fake um, algorithmic act and the no biometric barriers to housing act. Can you tell us um, what that experience entailed uh, working on government policy with the, the Ohio, with the U S house of representatives? Yeah. So I was working alongside my current um, congressperson and basically government is all about who gets to win in the marketplace of ideas. So as communicators, as journalists, we're actually really well positioned to work in advisory roles because all the member needs is a story that they can buy into that aligns with either their legislative um, ambitions, their political ambitions, um, and, and hopefully, and in my case, this is the truth, what they're trying to do in terms of advancing the public good. And one of the things that happened while I was at Google was an engineer, a black engineer from a different company had discovered that when they typed in the search term into Google search, black teenager, a bunch of mugshots came up. 
So when they typed in white teenager, a bunch of high schoolers came up. And that was really a marked racial difference. And because I was working in the company and I was working closely with product teams, I actually still do as a consultant. We knew that the, the reason that those pictures were coming up is that there was a human who was responsible for tagging those pictures and had made that racist association between young black people and crime, but was not making that association with white people and white young people. And that's an example of how you can encode racist messages into a technical project product. And the way that we get those images is through algorithms. The same, a very similar story about a year later when the, when the, when the term black woman was put in, gorillas came up. And we know from Sophia Noble's work that when you put in the term black girls, pornified images of young black women come up. I say that to say that when I got to do this advisory work, I'd actually met my member through the Obama work about five years prior. Um, she was really looking to understand how technology worked. And when I told her these stories, she was appalled. And I was saying, yes, yeah, so what we really need to do is regulate these algorithms because what algorithms are, are the decision-making parts of a software program. So if you go onto Twitter, for example, and you get to see, you look on your timeline, a decision has been made by the company around what content you're going to see. That decision has been driven by algorithms. And if we don't regulate them, then every time questions around black people, black humanity uh, are asked, to these algorithms, they're going to be racist. Um, this is, let me think, where are we now? This is like 2016, and nobody knows what I'm talking about. Um, certainly journalists don't know what I'm talking about. And there's a practice in journalism at, around that time of just reporting on trending topics. And so for me, it was incredibly important to introduce these ideas to the House. The bills that you mentioned are what are called messaging bills. So when a member is introducing a new idea, they will put together a bill that they know is not going to pass. At the time that these were introduced, we had Paul Ryan in the House. We had Mitch McConnell in Cong uh, leading the Congress, and we had Donald Trump. As president, so we knew that we weren't going to pass, but we knew that we had to put something on the table to really start to educate other lawmakers around not just what algorithms were, but how they were harmful to Black people. Absolutely. And so to go from 2016, you knew then in 2016 that something needed to be done. And so now in 2021, just days away from 2022, artificial intelligence, it's here. Um, we use it every day when we open our phones with the Face ID, with our banking apps, um, anybody that has a smart home device, and um, even with the ride sharing apps. And so this form of technology seems to, to be making our lives easier, or if nothing else, more convenient. But what are the dangers of AI and how, how do the policies introduced to Congress how are right now, the policies that you've introduced to Congress, how are they directly going to address those dangers? <laughs> so, yes, thank you. Um, AI is definitely very convenient and it does all of those things that you mentioned, as well as, you know, <laughs> deciding who gets to go to jail, for example, who gets to go free, um, et cetera, et cetera. So those, the Algorithmic Accountability Act is actually been reintroduced in 2021 and being extended. Um, Senator Wyden is the, is the um, U.S. Senate partner on that, and hopefully it will get passed. But, you know, we are in election season now, so I'm sure that that will be halted, honestly speaking. Um, but we have to just keep reintroducing, reintroducing, reintroducing in terms of that bill. Um, in terms of the dangers of AI, AI systems, um, just to give you a brief de definition, so AI um, is a form of technology, it's a form of computer science 
And it's where you have technical machines that perform human-like tasks. So you might say hi to Siri in the morning. Siri hears you in inverted commas, but it's a machine, so it doesn't actually hear. There is an algorithm that is picking up your audio, matching your words to words in a database, and then giving you a response. So that would be an example of something that is artificially intelligent, right? Because we think about hearing machine, hearing as being a human um, cognitive uh, function, the same with seeing machines, facial recognition. Your phone does not see you. It does not have optical nerves. It does not have an iris. But what it does have are algorithms that have been trained to recognize images. And the dangers with those are like the example I gave with Google search. Often what machines are seeing and hearing is racist by design. For example, facial recognition that is often used in police investigations does not recognize black faces accurately 40% of the time. And those are systems that are being developed by Amazon, being developed by Microsoft, being developed by IBM. Police forces use these. And so we've had cases throughout 2021 where black men have been arrested. In Detroit, we have Robert Williams. Um, in New Jersey, we have Nigeria Peters and actually held um, in custody because they have been wrongly identified. So the work that AI for the People does, which is my firm, is figure out how do we put these stories into journalism? How do we put these stories into popular culture? And how do we normalize this? And for anyone that watches shows like Dear White People, for example, the last two the last the last two um, series of that, the showrunners have done a really incredible job of talking about technology in that way for a black audience. And our work is to figure out how can we get those same narratives across the board. Um, I often say, can you imagine if a character in Insecure, Molly, for example, being the lawyer, had been looking at cases where facial recognition had been used in a way that was harmful to black people. And that had just been kind of some of the ambient discussion going on within the script. Yes. And um, along with that, I have a short audio clip that um, I want to share um, with everyone um, that Mutali brought to my attention um, because along with everything that has just been mentioned about AI, there are also the, there's also the threat of um, AI impacting our democracy. So please let me know uh, if you all do not hear um, this clip. So I'm gonna go ahead and start it. Doing this between now and November of 2020, and the public is gonna have to be uh, informed that you have uh, people in our own country, Republicans, who are acting like uh, you know, Russian agents basically okay. sowing disruption in our democracy. Alex, Alex, is, it, a, a, you, Alex is vital. The African Americans out there uh, who want to see the black agenda, that is fair. But to have this purity test for Senator Kamala Harris is shameful. They should be called out. And African American leaders, civil rights leaders, Congressional Black Caucus, and others should be challenging these folks because it is ridiculous. And what they are doing, they are actually trying to suppress the vote. And don't be surprised. If you see Russia in 2020 pick up on this to right. form a sort of dissent within the black community. And again, if you want to challenge Senator Harris on policies, do so. But do not dare question the issue of blackness. Because Roland, if you do, Roland, well, then you can't talk about, uh, of course, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. You can't talk about Malcolm X, whose mother's from Grenada. You can't talk about Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier. Uh, there are, you can't talk about Colin Powell, it's, Eric it's, Holder. It's so there are many African Americans who have family from the African diaspora. Like well, Roland, I just want to make, I want to pick up on one of your points. I'm not sure that all the people tweeting this material are even black. Because well, no, 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 you, you, you have you a lot of people who are in fake. 2016. You saw Russians and Republican operatives trying to get African Americans to not vote for Hillary Clinton. So there's 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 a lot of uh, people who are not who they say they are. So I, well, I John, think John, John, a lot of these folks are black. So with that with that 
clip, and that is a clip from Roland Martin's uh, Un Unfiltered. And uh, this is from June 30th, 2019. And so something that I wanted to really focus on um, tonight is how AI and various forms of technology are targeting the black community specifically. And Mutali, if you could uh, just uh, explain for us what you have seen and what you are now researching in terms of AI and its implications uh, for um, for our democracy. Yeah, so um, I, like I said earlier, have been playing with Twitter since about 2008. Um, and so one of my huge obsessions is social media. And as I was saying, the, the things that we see on social media are driven by these algorithmic systems, right? The brains of the machine that decide how, how something works for you. And one of the things that we started to look at, at AI for the People in 2019, were the messages that were being pushed to Black communities through the Twitter platform um, during the times of voting. And it was really inspired by the Mueller report because they found in 2016 that Russian operatives had been using kind of Black Lives Matter to grow these Facebook groups and these Facebook communities that would initially reach out to black people around the policing. Uh, police involved killings of black men. And eventually, as we got closer to the election, encourage uh, black people not to vote. In 2019, and this, this is what Roland Martin was referencing in the clip, there was a new narrative that was, um, uh, that was circulating. And it was the hashtag Kamala is not black. And what was so interesting about that particular hashtag was unlike 2016, where it was Russian operatives, these were actual black people who were advancing this hashtag. And the reason that they were advancing it is that they did they wanted to kind of upend her primary campaign. And it goes to this disinformation definition I gave at the beginning, which was First of all, Kamala Harris is black by the standards by which we think about blackness in this country. She has one black parent. She um, went to Howard University. She's an AKA. She identifies as a black person. She was raised by an Indian mother. And with, with the help of a black woman who lives next door, who, whose Bible she uses to swear um, every time she gets elected to office. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the idea that she wasn't black represented that lie. And then the idea that because she wasn't black, black people shouldn't vote for her was this kind of this, this intentional pushing of the vote. And what was so interesting to me as a technologist was that the Twitter algorithm was feeding this information onto black timelines. It became a national story after um, a black Republican, Ali Alexander, tweeted this and Donald Trump Jr. retweeted it. And in Donald Trump, Trump Jr. retweeting it, that's where my interest in the idea that Kamala isn't black, the idea of racial purity being a factor um, in that particular election, and the idea that the Twitter algorithm was allowing this information to propagate onto the site and not regulating it were have, are really the, the, the basis of my new work as a scholar. So I'm currently, um, much like you, Monique, I'm in graduate school. I'm at Columbia and I'm um, working with the School of Journalism to really look at that data set and try and figure out who were the people that were retweeting this and what were their goals. The great thing about social media is that people tell their business, so it becomes very easy once you have a data set to, to unpack the messages. But the thing that is so interesting is that Ali Alexander, the black Republican that I mentioned, um, also is being interviewed by the January 6th committee because he took responsibility before the insurrection for actually planning the Stop the Steal rally. And he has been um, testifying around the, the 
around basically the planning of that rally, how, how much the GOP were involved, and ultimately the president. We do know that at least in the case of this hashtag, Donald Trump Jr. was somebody who was watching Alexander um, at the time. So I, my data is an end. But I'm really interested at how algorithmic decision making around who got to see that hashtag, the um, inclusion of a black man kind of <laughs> pushing that hashtag, and then the policy decisions made by Twitter to not stop that circulating, and um, what that did in terms of uh, access to democracy in 2020. And um, what what would you consider in terms of responsibility? What responsibility do we as uh, media and communications professionals, journalists have in preserving democracy and bringing to light all of the issues that have, um, and there are many, but just the few that have come up tonight? I think as journalists, we need to now understand that the information we see on social media isn't just what our friends are posting, right? We're behind now the Facebook papers. We understand that these, um, <laughs> these platforms have an economic interest in pushing content that is divisive, pushing content that is hateful. And so we can't just report on you know, we can't just report on these online trends as if there isn't a political um, uh, intent. And we're seeing this a lot with uh, COVID information, for example. And we're seeing that there are accounts that are pushing misinformation, sorry, I'm some more noisy, misinformation and misinformation about the vaccine to black communities. And so I think understanding the role that algorithms play in news delivery is really important. 55% of American adults are getting their news on social media. I also think doing stories that can help people um, protect themselves. One of the things that I always say, because I do a lot of consultancy work around this, is if the content makes you angry, it makes a lot of money for the social media company. So don't retweet it, don't respond to it, walk away. Um, and the third thing I think that black journalists can do is develop intellectual curiosity around what our technology, how our technology either advances um, anti-racism, if that's the case, or advances white supremacist notions and ideas and sexist notions and ideas, queer phobic notions and ideas. And the reason that I think that that becomes really important is, um, you know, work that we're doing, for example, with AI for the People is trying to show how depictions of technology in popular media actually lead to, the, to innovation happening and then policies being created. So one of the projects we're looking at is based in the year 2002, and we're looking at the movies that were out, the technologies that were there, and then what happened in the real world. And facial recognition, which we've discussed earlier, for example, in policing, is something that's looked at um, in the movie Minority Report. I'm sorry, predictive policing. In Minority Report, the way that predictive policing is depicted in that movie led to the innovation of those products, which showed up, the NYPD tested in uh, 2012 these products. It led to the over-policing and criminalization of black men and boys in New York, same in LA. And then when we look at the policies, there was no policy response because people think that technology is just created by these geniuses in Silicon Valley. And very often the tech technologies that we see are born in science fiction and other forms of media, and the, w the ways that they're used are ways that ultimately hurt Black people, and I don't see that line being drawn. And the only time I've seen it being drawn was around the, the release of Black Panther, and people were still like, oh my God, look at Wakanda, look at these things. And I would love Black journalists to be more curious about 
who's developing the technologies, what do those technologies do, and how can we, um, in the public interest, um, do stories that, that educate, inform, delight, and entertain audiences, but also leave them with the, with the tool that they need to lean onto their lawmakers. And uh, how can everybody that's watching and are listening tonight support the work that you're doing with um, AI for the People? Well, our website launches um, <laughs> next month, a few days, um, and it's AIforthepeopleus.org, AIforthepeopleus.org. I will make sure that you have it. It will be up by the end of January. We are about to release a film um, with the Smithsonian Museum that looks at Afrofuturism. And what we're basically seeing is that Afrofuturistic approaches to, to innovation, design, and storytelling uh, pre present this idea of technology that's in the public interest. And that could be used to spark the imagination of black technologists as well as lawmakers around what we can do. So there's gonna be a symposium that the Smithsonian are hosting at the end of January called Claiming Space. We will have a film there. So please tune into that. I will make sure you all have the link um, and support the film. And then I think the third thing that they can do is get curious. And we have a consultation link that's on our website. If you are thinking about stories around technology, if you want to do background on, on these issues, then contact us through our website and we can um, definitely either help you ourselves or refer you to folk. Because unfortunately, Google, for example, um, is being investigated at the moment for systematic discrimination against black women. So even when we get into these companies, it's really difficult for us to stay. And my belief is that AI should be for people, for the people, and it shouldn't be used against us. So we would love to be your partner. All right. Mutali, thank you so much. Um, I, I, well, Will and Lee both know I could, and you at this point know, I could sit and talk about anything about uh, technology, the, the large umbrella <laughs> of everything that has to do with tech. Um, for for hours, but we we don't have um, you know our show's only thirty minutes, so sometimes we go over. Um, but I would love to continue the conversation um, in other ways, and I will make sure that Lee and Will know uh, when that happens. But I just want to thank you for joining us tonight to raise awareness um, about specifically um, AI and um, even more specifically bad AI. Um, even though we have some good forms um, of it and to, if nothing else, to have piqued the interest of uh, all of our uh, listeners and viewers to, um, edu to educate themselves and to start having these conversations. This was Thank simply... you so much for the invitation, y'all. And, um, you know, for any of you who are sitting at home and being like, the math ain't math in, I need to get out this newsroom there is a space for you and you can still be a professional communicator. This was fantastic. This was simply, uh, yeah, I don't know any other way to describe it, but fa a fantastic, fascinating. Um, good job, uh, Monique, and, and thank you to our guests. This was, I, I really, I'm, I have so many thoughts. I mean, so many thoughts in my in my mind that I'm just trying to process it. I'm I, I need to, you know, I'm you gonna can't wait down. to go and do research. I know, yeah. I know. That's what it's done for you. <laughs> you can't wait to go learn more. Yeah, definitely. And I'm just inspired by your career trajectory, and um, you're still a storyteller, but just in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think when we decide to do this work, it's because we believe that Black people should be the heroes in their stories. And just the racism within newsrooms, you know, trying to get our work commissioned, all of those different things often operate as barriers to um, And there is another way. There is another way. And you can still do that work. Um, but for me, I just kept saying yes. I failed a lot. 
Um, and when I didn't fail, I was like, come through black people, let's do this. Cause we still need to make sure that we're the heroes of our stories, whether we're in newsrooms or not. Agreed. Well, Matali, thank you again. It has been a pleasure. And uh, I want to thank Will and Lee and Aisha. We did not. Um, I just I want to send well wishes to our uh, third host because I'm always I'm normally in the background, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show. Our third host is Aisha Jefferson, and she is under the weather. And so we all send her good and healing vibes uh, for her to feel better very soon and um aisha i thank you also for letting me be part of the team and i look forward to seeing you all virtually and maybe, maybe one day in person again <laughs> in chicago but i'm too i'm too afraid to hop on a flight so maybe maybe not right now but one day Definitely. okay all right thank everybody you so have a good night Bye -bye. Um, good Will, night, good night. Will and Lee, any any final thoughts on this last show of 2021? I, I think it gives us a, a lot of information to think about. And as a, as a journalist who covers uh, race and culture, this has really given me a, an interest in a topic that um, I previously really had not, not covered. And so I just want to commend you for bringing this conversation to light and you you handled it so well we should have had you host more shows while while you were here and we appreciate again your uh, production value for our little nabj wind down wednesday and um we wish you well and we're just grateful that we're going to still be able to be in, in in contact with you um outside of nabj well thank you and it wasn't little small but mighty this was this was great. We had a good time. Had I a good time. Glad that you're here. And even though you won't be necessarily involved with the podcast, we'll all still be friends outside of this. And that's to me the most important part. You know, Ohio wants to stick together. So it's always a true thing. Um, so I'm just glad that we had this time, especially looking forward to 2022 because you know tomorrow's in promise, but I'm glad we're having, you know, friendships and laughs about any number of things. And this is just great. And thank you so much for um, bringing the guests to the, the space. Cause I was ready to just have Monique out there. <laughs> <laughs> so Not this time. To learn and grow as well as the time to celebrate you on this platform. Thank you so much, Lee. Well, we talked a lot about social tonight. So I'll see, I'll see you all on one of these platforms. Before and if not, go, though, if not that, I'm sorry, go ahead. So we're talking about Ohio. How do we feel about Cincinnati versus Alabama in this bowl game? Cincinnati's going win. I feel that I will not be saying the words Roll Tide, and yeah. I am now a Bearcat fan. I love my Buckeyes. As a matter of fact, I love my Buckeyes so much, they're right behind me. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> great, pl great, great placement. I need to go let this dog out. Before he lets it out on the floor, please. So, so I, I got to go. Yes, you you do because that that is a good reason to do that. So I'll see you all um, soon again, all right. very soon. Happy Kwanzaa, Happy New Year, Merry belated Christmas. Thank you. Good see day. you all. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>